Hi everyone, welcome back. So today we're gonna to be talking about the case of Sabrina Zunic and um, I don't even know where to start with this case. This case is definitely a shocking one, of course, but it's such a strange one. It's a disturbing one. It's not a very nice one. I mean, none of them are, but this one, mm, yeah, not nice. So initially Sabrina was charged with the murder of her foster mother, but later it actually came out that Sabrina was groomed by her foster dad into murdering his wife for him. Zunich's guilty plea is a formality because in June she provided damning testimony against the mastermind of the murder, Lisa Knafel's husband, 43-year-old Kevin Knafel. There's just so many layers to this case because obviously Sabrina murdered someone, but she's also a victim herself in a way. What was his relationship to you? It was when a foster father when needed to be and when a lover when, when not being a foster father. Zunich told the jury that after Kevin Knafel seduced her and began a sexual relationship with her, he convinced her to kill his wife. So yeah, we're going to get into all of that in today's video, so let's just jump straight in. But before we get on to today's case, we do have a sponsor, so I just want to give a huge thank you to Star on Disney Plus for sponsoring today's video. Now, I'm an absolutely huge fan of Disney Plus. I watch so much on there, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are the same. Let me know if you're also fans of Disney Plus. Well, Star on Disney Plus have some awesome Awesome new and exclusive shows that will be available this month. The final season of The Walking Dead has just started, which is like one of the best TV shows ever. And if you haven't ever watched The Walking Dead, uh, you should, because it's amazing and go binge it right now. The only way this works is if we trust each other. I don't leave anybody behind. There's also a new epic show coming called Why the Last Man, which is set in a post-apocalyptic world in which a mystery event has wiped out all mammals with a Y chromosome, except for one cisgender man and his pet monkey. This is coming later this month and it definitely looks right up my street. Without men, there is no future. We will rebuild together. There's also another new show that has just started streaming recently called Only Murders in the Building. And I know you're all absolutely going to love this show. It's definitely the one that I was most excited for. The show follows three strangers played by Selena Gomez, Martin Shaw, and Steve Martin. And these three strangers share one thing in common. They are all absolutely obsessed with true crime. And then all of a sudden they find themselves wrapped up in a murder mystery investigation of their own. I look around for clues. You wanna come? Do I wanna break into a dead guy's apartment? Sounds like an afternoon. A great murder mystery unpeels itself. The secrets are the fun part. Sometimes it's easier to figure out someone else's secret than to deal with your own. There's been three episodes so far and I have absolutely loved it. One of my favorite things about the show is just how different it was from my expectations because there are a lot of true crime dramas out there and sometimes they can be a little bit predictable. But this takes a completely different spin on things and I absolutely love the humor in the show, especially Martin Short's character, Oliver. I love his blunt, sassy, sarcastic humor. I just love how he says it how it is and he just says what everyone's thinking. I also love how relatable the show is as a true crime addict and it's just so weird to watch the show as someone that does create true crime content. Like I said the three characters in the show are three strangers and they wouldn't normally be friends but they started to bond over their love of a true crime podcast and I just was like oh my god that just reminds me of the true crime community how we can all come together and bond over our one obsession which is true crime. So if you guys want to check out Only Murders in the Building and trust me you're gonna love it you won't regret it. It is now streaming exclusively with Star on Disney Plus, which is available from $7.99 a month. I'll leave a link on the screen and in the description box. So if you wanted to go check out Star with Disney Plus, go to my description box and click on that link. Thank you again to Star on Disney Plus for sponsoring today's video, but thank you to every single one of you watching right now because without all of you, I wouldn't have opportunities like this. And now let's jump into today's case. So Sabrina Zunic was born on the 27th of October, 1994, making her a Scorpio and she grew up in a small town just outside of Cleveland, Ohio. Now, Sabrina didn't have a stable childhood whatsoever. Her parents struggled with alcohol and drug addictions, and both parents were just in trouble with the law for various different things. Sabrina's mom did spend some time in prison for scamming the welfare system, and she was also arrested on numerous occasions for drug charges. Her dad was also arrested multiple times for various DUIs, and also domestic 
violence offences. Sabrina's dad would often become quite aggressive with Sabrina's mom. Sabrina's dad was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic and he would often become aggressive with Sabrina's mom when he would stop taking his medication. So this is the kind of world that Sabrina was living in for the early part of her childhood. It was very chaotic, very toxic. And at the age of four, Sabrina was diagnosed with ADHD. And then throughout her childhood, she was also diagnosed with anxiety, depression, ODD, and bipolar disorder. So in the end, Sabrina was mainly raised by her grandmother and her grandmother also lived in the family house. It's not like she moved out to her grandmother's, but even with the support of the grandmother, because I think she actually was a stable parental figure, even with her support, it didn't stop Sabrina from going down a wrong path. Sabrina regularly got into trouble at school. It is reported that Sabrina did suffer with anger issues and she would often get into fights at school. And I don't know the exact age, but I do know that it was before the age of 14. So still so young, Sabrina started to experiment with drugs and alcohol herself. And it was around this time as well that she started to steal to fund her addiction. So the older Sabrina got, the more difficult she was to handle, the more off the rails she went and she just became too much for her grandmother to handle. And obviously her grandmother is her primary caretaker. I don't really know, like I couldn't find out. I don't really know where her biological parents were most of the time. It was literally just her grandmother. So at the age of 14, Sabrina was sent to the Emma Cayley receiving home, which is described as a behavioral modification institution. Following her stay at this home, she was placed into the foster care system. And throughout her teenage years, from the age of 14, she would just be moving from one place to another. And then it was in July 2011 that Sabrina was placed in the foster family of Kevin and Lisa Knafel. So Kevin Knafel was born on the 16th of June, 1970, making him a Gemini. And Kevin married Lisa in 2006. And a few years after the couple got married, they did go on to have a child together who they named Hayley. Now, Lisa did already have a daughter from a previous marriage. Her name was Megan and all four of them lived as a family in Willoughby Hills, which is just a suburb of Cleveland. And this was actually not too far from where Sabrina grew up. And it's said that the Knafel family were a pretty normal family. Like that's what others describe them as anyway. Kevin did work as a truck driver and Lisa was a social worker. And more specifically, Lisa actually worked in the family and children department and she mainly dealt with victims of sex abuse crimes and she had to deal with a lot of incest cases. And Lisa absolutely loved her job. She was so passionate about helping people and it just came naturally to her. And she has just been described as just so caring, so compassionate, just willing to help everyone and wanting to help everyone as well. And she had to support a lot of children in difficult situations, people like Sabrina. And she truly did care deeply about her job. She really did care deeply about the children and the families that she worked with. And it's said that because of Lisa's kind, caring nature, that this is what led her to want to expand her family through foster care. Lisa actually fostered several children, but the children that she did foster were quite young. They were mainly infants. So when Lisa and Kevin Knafel fostered Sabrina in July 2011, Sabrina was actually the first teenager that they'd ever fostered. And when Sabrina first moved into the Knafel family household, everything at the beginning anyway went great. She fitted in perfectly. Sabrina got on really well with Lisa. She also got on really well with her foster sisters, both Megan and Hayley. And I think Megan and and Hayley, who Megan was 13 at the time and Hayley was three years old. I think they also enjoyed having that older sister in the family. And Sabrina's life right now was probably the most stable it's ever been. And this actually showed in her school life because her grades dramatically improved. She actually attended school, which was rare for Sabrina prior to being fostered by the Knafel family. She would ditch school quite often and she became like a model student. She was never late, she never missed school. Her grades really improved. And overall, she just seemed like a really happy teenager. But unfortunately, this didn't last for very long. Over the next few months, tensions did start to rise between Lisa and Sabrina. Sabrina just felt like her foster mom would always favor her biological children over Sabrina and that she would just never truly fit in. However, the situation between Sabrina and Kevin 
was completely different. Sabrina just felt like Kevin never mistreated her. He never judged her. He always made her feel welcome and that she was a part of the family. And Sabrina just felt like she could completely rely on Kevin for absolutely anything. If she had a problem, she could go to Kevin and he would help. Where I think Sabrina didn't really feel like that about Lisa. So over time, Sabrina and Kevin grew closer and closer and people around them started to notice this and people started to think that they were getting a little bit too close like unnaturally close. Sabrina's friends just described Kevin as a really creepy man and he would always make sexual jokes towards Sabrina. It's honestly just so creepy. I'm so sorry, I hate having to say all of this. Sabrina's friends also described Kevin as a quote, touchy dude. Ugh. And this next bit is just so creepy. It's so disgusting. So there was this one incident where Sabrina had to have a meeting with her social worker at school. And Kevin was there at this meeting. It was to like sort out a dispute or something with another student. I don't really know. So Kevin went to this meeting with Sabrina and the social worker. And the social worker has said that in the meeting, Kevin asked Sabrina to sit on his lap and in between his legs. It's just the arrogance for me. It's like you're in front of a social worker and that is your behavior. So it's like, if that is your behavior in front of a social worker in public, what the hell is your behavior like behind closed doors? And a lot of people have just started to notice all of this just weird, suspicious behavior, but no one actually knew what was going on behind closed doors. But what was going on behind closed doors is that Kevin and Sabrina had started a sexual relationship. Sabrina's relationship with her foster dad turned sexual in the spring of 2012. So approximately about nine months after she first arrived at the foster home in July of 2011. And this next bit is just so creepy. I will spare you the gory, disgusting details. Um, so the relationship started with massages. Oh. Kevin started to ask Sabrina to massage his inner thighs because he was a truck driver and his legs would cramp up. So he needed a massage. Seriously, it really creeps me out. So it started with massages on the legs. Um, things progressed from there. I think we all know where it went. I don't need to say it because it's just too disgusting. So each massage, it would kind of slowly escalate. They would engage in sexual activity until eventually Kevin and Sabrina were having sex by the summer of 2012. In the summer of 2012, Sabrina is still only 17. She's a minor. So regardless of if this sexual relationship or whatever was consensual. You cannot ignore the fact that Sabrina is still a minor and Kevin is supposed to be her foster dad. So he's in a position of power. He's abusing that power. Sabrina is a child placed in the care of Kevin and Lisa. She is very vulnerable and Kevin is just completely taking advantage of her. So whilst this relationship between Kevin and Sabrina was going on, Kevin and Lisa's relationship was getting worse. Apparently Lisa just knew that something wasn't right between Kevin and Sabrina. And I just wonder, like, because obviously her line of work, she worked with victims of sex abuse. And uh, let's not beat around the bush here. Kevin is a sexual predator. I wonder how much she actually picked up on in the house because of her line of work. So Kevin and Lisa would argue all the time. And the situation actually started to get so bad that they started to talk about getting a divorce. And there was one incident where the arguing was so bad, the police were called. And they were called out because of a domestic violence incident. And it's because apparently Kevin had grabbed the 13 year old Megan by the back of the neck. And because of Kevin doing this, Lisa called the police. And Kevin was apparently furious that Lisa called the police because you know that they were talking about having a divorce. Well, Kevin was hoping to be able to get custody of the younger daughter. Remember that the younger daughter, Hayley, who is three years old now, she's the only one that is biologically Kevin's. Um, and he was hoping to get custody of Hayley after the divorce. And he was furious that the police were called because he was just like, well, this is just gonna ruin my chances, isn't it? And also at this time, which truly is just so creepy, Sabrina started to act very, very 
motherly towards Hayley, the three-year-old. And it wasn't like a like older sister kind of motherly kind of relationship. No, it was basically Sabrina acting like Hayley's mom. Full stop. She wanted to be Hayley's mom. And Sabrina and Kevin had this little fantasy that after the divorce, they would live together, there would be a little family and they would have Hayley, the three-year-old. So obviously with Sabrina acting like this, this made the tension between Sabrina and Lisa even worse. And apparently at one point, Lisa actually tried to kick Sabrina out of the house. Now, I don't know why she wanted to kick Sabrina out of the house. I don't know if it's because of the weird relationship between Sabrina and Kevin or the weird relationship between Sabrina and Hayley. But regardless, Lisa was just like, yeah, this is uh, getting a bit too much. Uh, Sabrina needs to go. But ultimately, Lisa didn't kick Sabrina out. I think uh, she was just caring, wasn't she? She's not exactly going to kick this vulnerable girl out of her house, um, even if she wanted to. Um, so she didn't follow through with these threats to kick out Sabrina. So it's October 2012 now, and Kevin and Sabrina have had a sexual relationship for quite a few months now. And Sabrina is heading towards her 18th birthday. I know, she's not 18. It's sometimes shocking when you remember that Sabrina is a child in all of this, because obviously I know that she's not innocent in this situation. It's just shocking, isn't it? Like, I just have to keep reminding myself that Sabrina is a child. And it's reported that it was around this time when Sabrina was almost 18 that Kevin came up with an awful plan. Basically, Kevin wanted Lisa out of the picture. He wanted custody of his young daughter, and he wanted Lisa out of the way, and he wanted to start this new fresh life with Sabrina and his daughter. And in order to achieve this, Kevin came to the realization that the only thing that he could do was get Lisa murdered. By the way, I don't know what he was planning with the other daughter, Megan, who is the 13 year old, because she is not biologically his, but he's still her stepdad, and they had still been living as a family unit for six years, but he clearly has no plans for Megan to join his little family situation. And Kevin decided to share this horrific plan with Sabrina. He said that if somehow Lisa wasn't in the picture anymore, then him and Sabrina could build a new life together and raise Hayley as their own. However, custody of Hayley wasn't the only motivating factor. No, there was a very big uh, <laughs> driving force. And I would actually say that this is the sole motive because there is no way that this man actually cares about his daughter. Because if he cares about his daughter, he wouldn't be planning her mother's murder, would he? So I think the sole motivation of him wanting to kill Lisa was because of a life insurance policy. It always comes down to money, doesn't it? Always. Kevin was set to gain around $800,000 if Lisa was to die. I wouldn't be surprised. I cannot confirm this because I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised if Kevin had a real big hand in uh, those life insurances and having them carried out and stuff. Kevin even said to Sabrina around this time that Lisa is worth more to him dead than alive. And I just want to point out because this is so sick and disgusting, when Kevin and Sabrina were talking about this murder and when they were formulating their plan, it was on the trips to school because Kevin used to drop Sabrina to school. And I feel like at this point, I just need to remind you all that Sabrina is his foster daughter, okay? So when he was driving Sabrina to school every day, they would talk about the murder and their plan but they would also have sex in the car on the way to school. I don't care if you're not biologically related. I don't care. This is your foster daughter. It's absolutely disgusting. He is one sick man. It's like he was driving her to school. She was still in school. I'm sorry, you're a 43 year old grown ass man. You, oh my God, he's having sex with someone that is still at school. No, because I know she's technically 18 right now because we're into November. I don't care, like this is just sick and disgusting. So after Kevin revealed all of this plan and everything to Sabrina, the two of them essentially had to decide how they were gonna carry out their plan. And this is when Sabrina started to ask her friends. Yeah, she started to ask her friends if any of them knew Hitman. I just don't understand. It's like, surely you would be keeping this on the down low, you know? You wouldn't exactly be advertising this. I don't think she told her friends that she wanted to kill Lisa. I think she was just asking them if they knew any hitmen. Um, but still, like, why would you, wh why would you do that? Um, so after she asked her friends if they knew any hitmen, they were just like, uh, funnily enough, no. And this is when Kevin asked Sabrina 
if she could be the one to murder Lisa. Yeah, that's right. Kevin wanted Sabrina to do his dirty work for him. The reason, apparently, according to Kevin, of why he asked Sabrina to murder Lisa and why he didn't want to do it is that he said that Sabrina would more likely be able to get away with it. So when Kevin initially approached Sabrina with this plan of her murdering Lisa, she wasn't like jumping for joy. Like she wasn't like, yeah, I'll do it straight away. And I think Kevin was expecting her to just agree straight away. So Kevin had to come up with a plan on how to convince Sabrina to murder Lisa. So on the morning of the 15th of November, 2012, on one of the journeys to school, Kevin pulled over and burst into tears. Sabrina started asking him like, what's wrong? Like, what is going on? Is everything okay? And Kevin told Sabrina that him and Lisa had had a huge argument the night before and that he was going to commit suicide if Lisa wasn't dead. He is just such a narcissist and a manipulator. It really frustrates me. And Sabrina was so concerned about Kevin. And I think it was in this moment that she became really concerned about Kevin because she'd realized that she had fallen in love with him and she was scared that Kevin might hurt himself. So unfortunately, Sabrina agreed to murder Lisa because she was so worried that Kevin would hurt himself if she didn't agree. And I just wanna point out that as soon as Sabrina agreed to murder Lisa, those tears stopped. And Kevin literally jumped right in to telling Sabrina all of the details on how the murder should go about everything. Kevin said that the murder should happen at night when Lisa was sleeping and that they should try and make it look like a burglary gone wrong. And Kevin was literally coaching Sabrina on how to stab Lisa. He was saying that once you stab her, you should twist the knife when it was in her to create the most damage possible. Kevin was also telling Sabrina that you need to stage the crime scene. You need to mess up the room a little bit to make it look like a burglary. You also need to take some of Lisa's jewelry, again, to look like a burglary. And if you're wondering, um, so what's Kevin's role in all of this? Where's Kevin gonna be? What's he gonna do? Because right now, Kevin's whole plan is for Sabrina to do everything. And that essentially was Kevin's plan. He wanted Sabrina to do everything. And Kevin's plan was that he was going to be at work. Remember, Kevin is a truck driver, so it would be quite common that he would spend a couple of days at work and he would sometimes work through nights as well. And on the night that they had planned to kill Lisa, this would just be conveniently one of the nights that Kevin was away at work. And it's clear to all of us, but this is just so Kevin would have an alibi for the murder. And Sabrina asked Kevin, like, what do I do if I get caught? And Kevin just replied, oh, you'll be all right. Just plead insanity. So this conversation was said to have taken place on the morning of the 15th of November. Very sadly, it was later that same day on the evening that Sabrina carried out this plan. At 1.15 a.m., Sabrina, put on a ski mask, picked up a 15 inch knife and made her way into Lisa's bedroom. And this is when Sabrina started to stab Lisa. But not everything went to plan because Lisa woke up straight away and she started to fight back. But not only did she start to fight back, she also started to scream. The screams woke up Lisa's older daughter, Megan, the 13 year old, and Megan came running into the bedroom. And I can't even imagine the sight that she would have seen because Sabrina was attacking her mother. She was absolutely horrified and she phoned 911 straight away. The police arrived very quickly to the scene and they found Sabrina still at the scene holding the bloody knife. But tragically, it was too late for Lisa and she was pronounced dead at the scene. It was determined that Lisa was stabbed 178 
times. These stab wounds were to the head, the neck, the stomach, as well as the arms and the legs. Lisa had also been stabbed in the eye. There was also wounds to Lisa's hands, and these are thought to be defensive wounds because Lisa was trying to fight off Sabrina. And two of Lisa's fingers, her left pinky and her right thumb, were nearly severed off. But the wounds that proved to be fatal was a stab wound to the carotid artery and also a stab wound to the lungs. And not only was Lisa stabbed 178 times, this was an extremely aggressive, brutal attack. And several of the wounds showed that the knife had been twisted after the stabbing. And this was just as Kevin instructed Sabrina to do. And this caused significant damage to Lisa and Sabrina had twisted the knife so hard that she'd actually bent the knife. Sabrina as well actually did suffer quite a few wounds from this attack um, and she actually did have to go to hospital for her wounds. And this just shows how frenzied this attack was. So the police, of course, arrested Sabrina. It's clear cut who did this. And the police start to investigate the scene. And when they're looking around, they found Haley, who is the three-year-old daughter, they found Haley in the closet of Lisa's bedroom. Oh my God, she was there the whole time. I don't know when she got into the room. Clearly she was woken up by the attack. I, I don't really know, but somehow Haley had ended up in the closet and she had witnessed this whole attack. So the police take Sabrina in for questioning, but Sabrina does not say a word. It's reported that she was actually in quite a state of shock. And following this, the police had to inform Kevin that his wife was murdered, <laughs> even though we all know that he already knew, but obviously the police don't at this point. But Kevin didn't really seem to take the news that badly. I mean, shocking. And when the police took Kevin to the scene of the crime, Kevin seemed more curious um, instead of horrified and upset, maybe angry, would be normal emotions for one to feel, but no, Kevin was curious. And let's be honest, Kevin was only curious because he wanted to know if the police had any evidence that would incriminate him. And the police noted that the whole time that Kevin was at the crime scene, he was just so calm, like he wasn't disturbed at all. And even when friends came round to visit Kevin, to comfort him, to show him support, they even noticed that Kevin wasn't acting normal. I mean, who's to say how one should act when they're grieving, but Kevin just didn't seem to care at all. One friend even described Kevin as aloof. And then literally hours, after he found out about Lisa's murder, Kevin phones up the insurance company to claim the life insurance. I mean, could he literally make it any more obvious? And it was at this point that Kevin really gave up the act of mourning, even though he didn't really act like he was mourning, but he really did give up at this point because he went on a lavish spending spree. He bought himself a new house in Florida, a camper van, some cars, some guns, and he even thought that this was the perfect time to pick up a new hobby. So he also started flying lessons. I sometimes just really struggle to understand these people because I'm like you are making it so obvious here. And whilst Kevin is outliving his new luxurious, lavish lifestyle, Sabrina is in jail for a crime. Let's be real that they both committed. Kevin didn't even go and visit Sabrina. I think he actually tried to visit her once, but he wasn't allowed access and then he gave up from that moment on. And Sabrina was expecting Kevin to visit her. I mean, Sabrina thought that they were in this together, that they would be able to get away with this and start their new life together. And I don't think Sabrina realized this right now. Kevin only intended for himself to start a new life. He didn't intend for himself and Sabrina to start a new life together. And he fully intended to let Sabrina take the fall for all of this. And this went on for eight months where Sabrina was just sat in jail and Kevin was just outliving his life. And Sabrina, I'm sure she was probably thinking, oh, Kevin will come eventually, like he will come, like we're in this together, but he never did. And over the eight months, Sabrina just got slowly more and more angry with Kevin. I think she was slowly waking up as well to who Kevin really was. And eventually after the eight months had passed, Sabrina just thought, you know what, screw it. If I'm going down, 
he's coming down with me. So in August of 2013, Sabrina tells investigators all about Kevin's involvement in the murder. She also told investigators that Kevin was the mastermind behind everything and how he was grooming her both emotionally and sexually since March 2012. And it was over this period where Kevin was grooming her that he convinced her to murder Lisa. And following this confession from Sabrina, the police did go and arrest Kevin. And he was charged with conspiracy to commit murder and complicity to aggravated murder, as well as six counts of sexual battery. The case went to trial the following year in June 2014. Sabrina was planning on pleading guilty, so there wasn't actually a trial for Sabrina. So it was just a trial for Kevin. So the trial opened and Kevin basically denied everything from the get-go. He never Never admitted anything. He said that everything that Sabrina said was just a part of a big fantasy that was in Sabrina's head, that he had nothing to do with Lisa's murder, and he also denied having any sexual involvement with Sabrina as well. He basically blamed the whole thing on Sabrina's mental health and the conditions that she had been diagnosed with, saying that these conditions made her unstable and this is why she committed the murder. The defense also argued that there was no physical evidence to back up the sexual relationship. And I was just like, well, why would there be physical evidence? You know, like Kevin is clearly, he's not stupid. I mean, he is stupid, but it's like, he's gonna cover his tracks, isn't he? The defense said that the only evidence of this sexual relationship was coming from Sabrina. So then it is the prosecution's turn to put forward their case. And of course they go into all of the details of Kevin and Lisa's relationship and how it deteriorated. And also Kevin and Sabrina's relationship and how it started. They also went into the fact that people surrounding the family had started to notice that Kevin and Sabrina were close weirdly close. Prosecution then showed the phone logs between Kevin and Sabrina in the two weeks prior to the murder. And in the two weeks prior to the murder, Sabrina and Kevin had either text or called each other 1,491 times. I know, that is excessive. That's like over a hundred a day. Don't know about any of you, but that seems excessive and not normal for an apparent father-daughter relationship. They then showed on the night of the murder between 7 p.m. and 1 a.m., Kevin had spoken to Sabrina either by text or by call 78 times. And obviously this was between 7 p.m. and 1 a.m. and it was 1.15 a.m. that Sabrina went in and murdered Lisa. Unfortunately, the contents of these texts and calls weren't able to be recovered, but um, I think the sheer number alone, like 78 times on the night of the murder, I think it's pretty damning enough. But I think it's Kevin's actions after the death that are probably the most damning. I mean, he wasn't bothered at all. And so many people have reported that he just wasn't bothered. And it was literally only hours before he claimed Lisa's life insurance after her death. And then he went on a spending spree. And that doesn't sound like somebody that's innocent. It, it doesn't. It sounds like somebody that is guilty and their motivation for killing someone is money. And then finally, it was Sabrina's turn to take the stand to give her evidence against Kevin and to give her version of the events. And she went into a lot of detail, let's just say. I just massaged it in her thighs and it progressively got more up into the genitals. We get into the car and I we give him a job. She talks about the grooming in quite a lot of detail. And she talks about how Kevin manipulated her and convinced her to murder Lisa. The insurance money would basically form this uh, happily ever after life for me and him. Why did you do that? Because I was doing what I was told to do. Right, and who told you to do that? Kevin. And once Sabrina had given her testimony, the jury did go away. And after nine and a half hours, the jury found Kevin guilty 
of all charges. So that was six counts of sexual battery, three counts of complicity to commit murder, and two counts of conspiracy to commit murder. And Kevin Knafel was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years before he is eligible for parole. Sabrina, after her guilty plea, was also sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 30 years until she is eligible for parole. During the trial, friends and family of Lisa were given the chance to stand up and actually give a statement. And 13 year old Megan's biological father, Nick, did stand up in trial to give his victim statement. And Nick called Kevin a piece of crap. I'd like to say, um, Lisa, we miss you. And uh, you, Kevin, what a piece of crap you are. Yes, Mr. Zanoff, I realize your emotions are great, but I would ask that you please restrain yourself and just address you are a weak individual. Objection, Your Honor. Mr. Zanoff, continue. And can you believe he actually got told off for doing this? It's like, oh my God, I, I get it. I know that those courtroom rules and, and stuff like that, and you have to abide by them, but it's like, this man is responsible for the murder of his daughter's mother. Let him call him a piece of crap. And he actually got kicked out of the courtroom for this. And then seven years after the trial, literally this year, Sabrina sat down to give an interview from behind bars where she gave a full account of exactly what happened. And she also made an apology for what she had done. And I know it doesn't change anything. I know it doesn't change what she has done, but I think her apology is pretty genuine. Like she does actually seem quite remorseful. Doesn't change anything, doesn't change the fact that she did murder somebody. She still went along with Kevin's plan. She was still the one with her own hands that did take Lisa's life. And she stabbed Lisa 178 times, which is crazy overkill. Like that is just so much rage in that attack. And that would have taken quite a long time as well. That is not a short attack by any means. That attack is filled with rage and anger. And of course we know that Sabrina did used to suffer with anger problems when she was growing up. And it does just seem like she was so angry and she was just channeling all of that into the attack on Lisa. I can't imagine why Sabrina would have been that angry at Lisa. I, I just can't. So it's, it's like she had just bottled up all of this anger and was taking it out on Lisa. I mean, I don't know, but something fueled that rage, that anger for her to stab Lisa 178 times. Like that is just crazy overkill and it was just so personal as well. And it's really hard this case to say how much Kevin manipulated Sabrina. I do think he did manipulate Sabrina, but by how much we don't know. I do think that Kevin is equally responsible in this murder along with Sabrina. I know he didn't take Lisa's life with his own hands, but if it wasn't for Kevin's plans and Kevin's manipulation, I can't see Sabrina murdering Lisa on her own accord, if that makes sense. And it doesn't change the fact that Kevin was in the position of power. He was the foster dad, which, oh God, it's just disgusting, isn't it? Because I do tend to forget that he was her foster dad and he completely abused that power. And Sabrina, with her childhood, she had grown up not really knowing what love was. She was desperate for love and Kevin preyed on that. He knew that and he showed Sabrina what Sabrina thought was love and Sabrina fell for it. Obviously the main victim in all of this, of course, is Lisa. She dedicated her life to helping people that were victims of sex crimes. And it's just a cruel twist of irony that Lisa was killed by a victim of a sex crime. And I also hope that Lisa's two daughters, Megan and Haley, are okay doing as best as one can with a situation like this. And along with Lisa, I think we need to remember that Haley and Megan are also the main victims of this story because now they don't have a mother. Their mother was taken away from them far too soon and they shouldn't have to grow up without their mother. But because of Sabrina and Kevin's actions, they are and my thoughts are with them and I just hope they're doing okay. And that is the end of today's case and it is just a complete sad one all around. It's horrible. As always, let me know your thoughts, theories and opinions and also don't forget to let me know your case suggestions because I always want to know what you want to hear next. Thank you again to Star on Disney Plus for sponsoring today's video and if you guys want to check out the new and exclusive shows available on Star with Disney Plus, I'll leave a link for you in the description box down below and I will see you in my next video. Bye.